All right, with all that housekeeping out of the way, I wanna again welcome you to March uh, Twin Ports Climate Conversation. This is a, a monthly community dialogue engaging in questions of climate change. We aim to cover different topics monthly, fo focusing on perspectives of climate change impacts, adaptation resources, and opportunities for mitigation and resilience. These conversations are organized and coordinated by staff from multiple agencies, and the logos you see here on this slide are just a selection of some, but not all of our partners. Today we'll be hearing from John Swenson, who is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Minnesota Duluth. His broad research interests include river and coastal sediment dynamics, landscape evolution, and mathematical models of heat and mass transfer in porous media. As a lifelong Duluthian, John has observed coastal erosion for more than 30 years. John will be presenting The Long View of Minnesota Point, Drowned, Starved, and Battered, the interplay of natural and anthropogenic processes, and an uncertain fate of Minnesota Point. And with that, John, please take it away. Great. Uh, thanks, Madison. And um, thank you to all who have joined me uh, here today. Um, I'm, I'm envisioning all of you in your pajamas, so that will help us get through this. Um, <clears throat> so as Madison noted, this is going to be a li little bit more of a geologic focused talk. Um, there is climate embedded in here. Uh, most of the climate material is um, near the end of the talk, so you're gonna have to suffer through me to get to that for a bit. Um, before I start out, I'd like to thank Julie for inviting me to uh, participate in this. That's very nice. And with that said, I think let's move on here. If I can figure out how to advance. Let's see here. First technological glitch. <laughs> I will, oh, there we go. I will warn everyone in advance that um, this is sort of a new approach for me. And um, I apologize in advance for it being a bit clunky. So, uh, the title of my talk, as Madison noted, is Drown, Starred, and Battered, basically just uh, getting at the long-term uh, fate of Minnesota Point. And I will warn you that um, I will intermittently, no doubt, refer to Minnesota Point as Park Point um, and Wisconsin Point, and maybe all three at the same time. Uh, I think we all understand what we're talking about in that sense. So the motivation for this work um, is actually rooted in my upbringing. So this is a photo of Eastern Duluth um, out near a little short of Lester River. The red arrow points to my house, uh, both my childhood home and where I currently live. Um, and you can see that the end of my yard is a, a large bluff that is subject to a considerable amount of erosion. Um, so this photo right here is taken in 1967 at the back of my yard and basically what I've done there is sketched in where the bluff edge was located in 1967 and where it is today and you can see straight away that there is and has been a considerable amount of coastal erosion. I'm going to talk primarily today about Park Point but one point I want to make straight away is that um, this system is coupled in the sense that Park Point and its predecessor um, you know, they derive their sediment from various sources. One of those sources is bluff erosion along the coastline. So in 2016, I had a survey done in my backyard um, and you're looking down upon it right now. We're gonna window in right there on the end of my yard and blow up a little bit part of the survey. And if you look carefully here, you can see that in 1923, when this um, lot was originally platted, the surveyors did a nice job of actually um, noting the location of the bluff edge. So the dashed uh, orange line there is essentially the approximate 1923 bluff edge. There is the 2016 bluff edge. Um, if we measure that and do the math on it, it's gonna work out to be about um, five to seven centimeters a year of bluff retreat in my backyard. So basically over the last 30 plus years, I have watched the dynamics of this system uh, firsthand. And it's, 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 it's very interesting. One point I'd like to make is that uh, typically we think of the Midwest as pretty boring with respect to all things geologic <clears throat> in the sense that we don't have any tectonics. But as a, I hope to point out, we actually do have some sort of quasi tectonics. And as a result, our coastline is actually very dynamic. Um, and that's an important point uh, when it comes to addressing shorter term problems. I, I think um, it's necessary that we have a good framework for understanding the long term in which to 
address the short term. So a few gratuitous photos from the back of my yard. Uh, I went down last night and took a few photos of the bluff, which is eroding right now. We're entering the erosion season, a lot of freeze thaw cycling. So you're looking right there at some talus, some, some uh, bedrock that's been eroded. Um, there's also some glacial till above that that is uh, wasting away. And one, one thought I would like you to carry for the next few minutes is what is the fate of that eroded material from my bluff in eastern uh, Duluth? So the goals of my talk here today are, uh, sorry for the wall of words here, but um, first of all, to highlight some research, recent work done by myself, my students, and my collaborators, then to take that work that we've done and synthesize it with the uh, work of others. And in, in essence, assemble the pieces of a puzzle here and come up with a, 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 a model framework for long-term source to sink sediment pathways in the Duluth coastal region. And then use that model to address some shorter term issues, uh, which I've grouped into two pieces, uh, one being anthropogenic infrastructure issues. So what I will refer to as the starved part of this talk. And the other part, anthropog anthropogenic driven climate change issues, which I will refer to as the drowned and battered part of this talk. And um, I think it's you know, important that as we sit on the cusp of spending potentially many tens of millions of taxpayer dollars, um, that we have a good understanding of how this system works on the longer time scale. Again, to provide a framework that will uh, protect us from making sort of um, short-term mistakes, perhaps, in our efforts to engineer our way out of some problems. So, um, deja vu, this feels like we've been here before. And in essence, um, you know, right now, unless you've been living under a rock for the last few years, you are well aware that um, Lake Superior levels are near record highs. Um, point I would like to make um, is that you know, while they're near record highs right now, we have certainly had many um, occurrences in the past hundred years where lake levels have been nearly as high. For example, back in the mid 90s, lake levels achieved some very high values and not coincidentally, that time period triggered some very important um, research work done on some of these issues that we're gonna to discuss today. And I will make reference to both of these publications on a couple of occasions. The one on the left is a um, report by the Corps of Engineers, uh, sorry, on Park Point erosion and sediment transport. And the one on the right is a Forest Service study on uh, sediment discharge from the Nemachi River Basin. So if I could sum up this talk in one sort of uh, set of bullet points here, it is as follows. And that is that we've had this problem in quotes of coastal erosion in the far western arm of Lake Superior for a long time, probably about 1200 years plus or minus the usual geologic slot. And that um, erosion is driven by a long-term slow by human standpoint rise in lake level. That lake level uh, rise fuels bluff erosion. It also is the re reason we have Minnesota Point and the reason we have the Duluth Superior Harbor. So the erosion problem, which is acute right now, when viewed through a long-term lens is actually um, beneficial in the sense that it provides the sediment ultimately that gives us Park Point and the Duluth Harbor. So this slide is really important and it sets um, a lot of information for the first half of this talk. So what you're looking at here is basically a sea level or lake level curve constructed by my colleague at University of Wisconsin Superior, Andy Breckenridge, based on some earlier studies around the Lake Superior Basin. The red curve is the level of Lake Superior around Duluth, so this is very important, near Duluth, as viewed from an observer on non-erodible bedrock. So we often refer to that as relative lake level. The take home message from this um, slide, this sea level, lake level curve, is that from about 4,500 years ago until about 1,200 years ago, lake level in the Duluth area was falling relatively slowly. 
about 1,200 years ago, plus or minus the usual geologic uncertainty, things changed profoundly. Basically what happened is the outlet of Lake Superior changed its location, and as a result of that, areas in the western arm of the lake have been experiencing a fairly rapid rise in lake level from about 1,200 years to now. So that rise rate is about two and a half to three millimeters in the Duluth area, which may not seem like much, but on from a geological perspective, that's actually extremely fast. So um, oftentimes, uh, well, I should say that we, you know, we don't have a really sound understanding of how old Park Point is. And if you um, look on the internet, uh, you'll find varying uh, answers to that question. I would suggest, and I think others that study these things would agree with me, that the most likely scenario is that Park Point was born about 1,200 years ago. So um, Park Point is a relatively young feature geologically, and we should always bear that in mind. So for the next few slides, I actually want to talk about the long time ago time period, 4,500 to 1,200 years ago, where we had this slow fall in um, lake level. And I assume we have a fairly broad audience here, so we're going to spend a little bit of time doing just a touch of review on a few coastal processes and a little bit of geologic nomenclature. We'll keep it to a minimum, um, but we need to have a few things in our toolkit, so to speak. So the first one is just um, the idea of waves and longshore transport of sediment. So the basic idea here is that if wave crests impinge on the beach at a certain angle, um, shown in the slide here, that basically those angled wave crests will set up, they will induce a current and associated transport of sand in the direction shown. So this is known as longshore transport, sometimes called the total drift. It is the dominant mechanism of concern here for essentially moving sediment around and reshaping the coastline on both long and short time scales. So very important concept. In the western arm of Lake Superior, uh, the dominant intervals of sediment transport by longshore transport are during times when we're being impacted by mid-latitude cyclones, either uh, what we typically call it in the winter Colorado lows or Texas hooks or Alberta clippers, doesn't really matter. The take home message is that any cyclone approaching um, our region will induce a period of east to northeast flow in the western arm of the lake. And that east to northeast flow will generate a net longshore transport of sediment, be it sand or gravel, or even to a certain extent suspended fines. That net transport of sediment will be directed towards Duluth on both coastlines, both the North Shore and the South Shore. So in essence, as shown here in the slide, the region around Park Point is a zone of very intense sediment convergence. And basically, at some level, we're going to end up with a depositional feature in this part of the world. So I want to discuss a little bit here what the source of this sand might be and how that source has changed on geologic timescales. This is an important point to make um, uh, because it sort of um, it, it, it gets to the issue of how Park Point formed. So just a little confirmation, if you will, of um, the net longshore transport direction. So this is on the North Shore and you're looking down at an aerial photo of Glensheen Mansion. And you can see straight away that the um, concrete dock at the mansion essentially serves as a dam for longshore transport directed towards Duluth. The point of the slide is simply to illustrate that um, a process that's sometimes difficult to see on, on, on human timescales. Uh, if you have a mechanism to trap that sediment, you get a very good idea of what the net sediment transport direction is. So here it is from the northeast to the southwest, in other words, towards Duluth. Same scenario holds true on the south shore of uh, the lake. Um, a little more terminology, we'll keep this brief, but um, I want to introduce the idea of a strand plane. So in essence, if you have a coastline where there is a net um, accumulation of sand, and if the lake level is relatively stable or maybe falling a little bit, you will accumulate 
a um, series of beach ridges that will build lakeward to form something called a strand plane. That is the hallmark of deposition under conditions of net sediment convergence and relatively stable or slowly falling sea level or lake level. So there are numerous examples of strand planes in the Great Lakes region. Here are two of them. The uh, upper strand plane on the upper left is um, on the Keweenaw Peninsula. It's Grand Traverse Bay, beautiful strand plane. Um, another example is uh, in Lake Michigan by the um, uh, west of Traverse City. So again, the key point of these features is that they form when you have stable or slowly falling lake level. And at this point, you may be thinking, what does a strand plane have to do with Park Point and the long-term fate? And we will get there in just a second. So again, focusing on this, uh, this slow fall in lake level from 4,500 years ago to 1,200 years ago, um, what I'm going to show right here is a cartoon conceptual model for how the sediment pathways in the western arm of Lake Superior worked most likely. And then moving forward from this slide, we'll contrast that with how things have changed from 1200 years ago until the present. So from 4,500 or 5,000 years ago to 1200 years ago, basically what was happening is that most of the sand supply was actually coming not from longshore transport, although it was certainly there. Um, most of the sand supply to the western arm, the Duluth region, was from the St. Louis River and the Nemaji River, both of which could discharge their sand loads to the lake and in the process of doing that form a strand plane that is now drowned. So I have actually taken the liberty here of taking that Grand Traverse Bay strand plane and uh, cropping it and inserting it and where you know today's park point is located. So during this time period there was no park point or alternatively you could think of park point as being the leading edge of that strand plane complex as it built seaward from lower left to upper right. In addition there was no harbor during this time period nor was there an estuary um, and there was relatively minor bluff erosion on the north and south shores. So most of the sand being transported by longshore currents was actually sand being discharged from north shore and south shore streams. Very little bluff erosion. So just some supporting evidence for that um, thought. This is a digitization of the 1863 herding map uh, of the Duluth Superior Harbor and Estuary. Um, which consisted of thousands upon thousands of hand um, uh, bathymetric uh, measurements. And if you stare at this digitization, which was done by my colleague Andy Breckenridge, you can see or convince yourself that there are actually some curvilinear or arcuate features that are in the harbor just landward of the of Park Point or Minnesota Point. Um, those are most likely buried beach ridges of a buried strand plane complex. Okay, so I poached this image from Wikipedia. This is Bathurst Inlet up in uh, far northern Canada. And if you squint and blur your eyes a little bit, you might convince yourself that a feature like that is actually sitting underneath the Duluth Harbor today, now covered by mud and a couple meters of water. My colleague at UMD, Nigel Watrous, and myself have been trying to image that feature um, with remote sensing techniques, seismic, GPR, echo sounders, et cetera. It's proved very elusive, but we are fairly confident it's there. And uh, Andy Breckenridge uh, has some shallow cores from the harbor that penetrate about half a meter of mud and then are into sand. So there's pretty strong evidence that that strand plane exists there. Okay, so that's sort of the pre-Park Point time period. About 1,200 years ago, things changed dramatically. So again, we have this change in the outlet of Lake Superior, and that triggered in the western arm of the Lake Superior region, it triggered a quite rapid rise in lake level from 1,200 years ago until the modern. So this lake level rise continues today. Let's discuss a little bit about the implications of that. Uh, the first thing that that 
um, rise in lake level did was to essentially trigger, um, turn on, if you will, like a light switch, quite pronounced erosion of bluffs on both the north and south shore. So this again is an image of my backyard, my neighborhood here. Uh, arrows point to a few features. There is the bluff itself, which consists of bedrock and a glacial till overlying that. There is a thin veneer of beach cobbles. That's the active sediment that has been removed or sourced, I should say, from erosion and retreat of that bluff. So what got me interested in this problem of uh, sediment pathways and, and, and part point overall is actually trying to understand what was happening in my backyard. So to that end, um, I did some work with a student of mine. Uh, we developed a a uh, fairly simple geometric model that relates the rate of bluff retreat. Uh, this cartoon holds for the North Shore, but the same idea works on the South Shore. Relates the rate of bluff retreat to the rate of lake level rise, which we know, we have constraints on that. And the slope, the geometry of the near offshore lake floor which um, both on the North Shore and on the South Shore is a surface of non-deposition overall. So it's an erosional surface. Um, so the geometry of that lake floor, which we can measure in principle, gives us valuable information about the long-term rate of retreat of bluffs on the North and South Shore. And those long-term rates um, are very useful in constraining uh, you know, um, rates that would be um, needed for shorter term studies. So I guess what I'm trying to say awkwardly is that it's handy to have um, short term measurements, for example, based on differencing of air photos on decadal type timescales, and to be able to compare those bluff retreat rates with long term rates, geologic timescales, and see how they compare. So um, my student Crystal and I tackled this. We gathered data from a variety of sources. We did some multi-beam bathymetry surveys uh, on the North Shore. We used some LIDAR data. We used some existing bathymetric data on the South Shore. And we essentially measured the geometry of that near shore surface. And from that computed some long-term bedrock, bluff, and South Shore bluff erosion rates. And those are tabulated here. Um, apologies for the four significant figures there on the first column. Crystal went a little crazy with that. Um, the take home message here is that on the North Shore, uh, the bedrock cord North Shore, the bluff retreats are on the order of centimeters per year. So my backyard is on the fast end. Uh, other regions, different lithologies are slower than that. A rough number you could come up with is about four centimeters a year. There's a lot of variability because of the mixture of lithologies. On the South Shore, where the material is unconsolidated sediments, mechanically weak, the rates are much higher. They're an order of magnitude higher. So on the order of 40 centimeters per year. And there's less variability in that because the material is more homogeneous. So if you summarize that information, basically on the North Shore, we have relatively slow bedrock bluff retreat. On the South Shore, we have quite rapid retreat of bluffs composed of um, glacial till. And here's an example on the south shore. So this is a strip uh, photo from last year showing um, recent, although again, this is a long-term process. This is a recent bluff erosion triggered by uh, particularly high lake levels um, in the last few years. So it obviously the problem is quite profound on the south shore. Again, the thing I would like everyone to think of is what is the fate of that eroded material? And the fate of it is summarized right here. So from 1200 years ago till today, basically the sediment pathways have changed in the western arm of Lake Superior around Duluth. And now the vast majority of sand being delivered to the Duluth area is coming from south shore bluff erosion. There's about an order of magnitude less material being delivered from bluff erosion on the North Shore. The important part here is that the St. Louis and the Magi rivers are no longer contributing significantly to Park Point. And as a result of that rapid rise in lake level, um, and this is a little more speculative, 
I suspect that the strand plane was abandoned. In other words, it was drowned. And then um, a new feature, a new landform, the current barrier, what we call Park Point, nucleated in the southeast part of the diagram here and built northwestward across um, to the North Shore and to form what is now the uh, Duluth Superior Harbor and the estuary and to protect it. So the take home message here is that today, um, basically all the sediment supply to Park Point is coming from South Shore Bluff erosion. Okay, that basically brings to an end the sort of geologic background to this discussion. Let's talk a little bit about some issues. And again, I broke these down into infrastructure problems and then climate change problems. So let's talk first about the infra infrastructure problem. Um, if the vast majority of nearly all of the sand that supplies Park Point is coming from South Shore Bluff erosion, we have a problem. And um, people have known about this for quite a long time. That 2001 survey I uh, highlighted at the beginning of my talk by the Corps of Engineers worked on this issue as well. And the problem here is that the superior entry is essentially forming a perfect dam, if you will, in that river of sand that's being transported by Longshore Transport. Um, what you're looking at here is, is, an, is an image I put together um, crudely, but it's basically a Google Earth image from 2000, 2017, superimposed on an aerial photo from 1938. So we have about an 80 year differential there. And you can see straight away that we've had upwards of 90 meters of erosion on the downstream side. And I'm referring to downstream and upstream with, with respect to the uh, longshore transport. Had about 90 meters of erosion downstream of the superior entry and about an equal amount of deposition on the upstream side. So basically, Park Point is being starved completely of its sediment supply. Here's just another image, same idea, superposition of a 2017 and 1938 image, just looking a little bit to the northwest of the superior entry near the, near the airport. And you can see the changes in um, Park Point width. Importantly, clearly Park Point is reaching a point where it is, you know, getting closer and closer to being at risk for breaching during a large event, and that would be problematic. Um, we can tell a similar story for the Duluth Superior Entry, which is essentially blocking the North Shore um, sediment flux and starving the point in that area as well. Um, that is um, with all due respect to the people who live there, that is a slightly smaller problem in terms of the sediment budgets because the amount of sand being transported from the North Shore is considerably less than from the South Shore. So the presence of the superior entry is kind of handy in that it allows, um, as because it traps essentially 100% of the sand coming from the South Shore, it allows us to do a sand budget on the system. and. Um, so I did a quick sand budget on this and I came up with roughly 35,000 to 45,000 cubic meters per year of sand that's being trapped. Um, that is sand from the South Shore Bluffs being trapped by the Superior Entry. Uh, the 2001 cores estimate was a little higher than that, more like 50,000 cubic meters per year. Um, but roughly speaking, those numbers are in agreement. The interesting part, I think, is that Basically, you can account for all of that sand budget by taking the bluff erosion rates that I showed a few slides back and essentially figuring out how much sand is liberated by that bluff erosion. And just doing a quick and dirty calculation, I come up with a number of about 40,000 cubic meters per year. The point being that essentially um, all the sand is being trapped by the superior entry is coming from bluff erosion on the south shore. There's very little contribution, it would seem, again, given the tremendous uncertainty in these calculations, very little contribution from south shore rivers. So bluff erosion is really the major contributor. So again, to sort of circle back to a theme from before, um, erosion, coastal erosion, we view right now as a, as a bad thing and, and certainly with good reason. Um, but Again, remember in the longer term view, it is the source of sediment that at least in principle or previously gave us Park Point. So a question we might ask and, and, and one that's been addressed a little bit in the past is 
if we were to try to offset the effects of a superior entry, in other words, try to nourish Park Point downstream of the entry, where might we go to get that sand to do that? Uh, so this is the idea of sand nourishment on the, on the point. So um, let's, look at, let's look at a couple of possible sources for sand to do that. So one question you might ask is, well, what about the St. Louis River? Is that still getting any sand to the harbor? Could we mine that sand? The answer is no. What you're looking at here is a series of three, uh, three images from 1861 up to the present showing essentially what uh, showing Spirit Lake. And if you stare at these for a while, you can convince yourself that the features of the earlier St. Louis River channel, in other words, it's levees, which are made of sand, those features are just simply being drowned throughout this entire time period. The take home message from that is that even as early as 1860, um, at the time of the herding survey, there was essentially no sand reaching Spirit Lake and therefore no sand even re no sand reaching the harbor as well. So um, essentially the St. Louis River is not a source of sand. If you actually want to dig a little deeper and figure out where the sand was being trapped at, uh, you know, in the 1860s, I think the answer is revealed right here. So on the lower left orange circle is um, in, encapsulating what's known as a bayhead delta, uh, which is basically that was the depot center for sand um, prior to humans installing dams upstream of that on the St. Louis River. So. The St. Louis River is a non-player for sand, so it is not doing anything to feed Park Point, help it out. How about the Nemagi? That's probably a, a better chance of being a sediment source. So the take home story from the Nemagi is that um, when lake level started rising 1200 years ago, um, basically the Nemagi, which prior to that had pretty good communication with the lake, so the superior entry was the natural outlet for the Nemagi River and the St. Louis combined. <clears throat> when lake level started to rise, um, the St. Louis system was drowned and stepped backward. We just looked at that the previous slide. The Nemagi River did the same thing, but to a lesser degree because it was more proximal to the lake. So today, any sand that exits the Dimaggi River is deposited in the harbor um, and then dredged. So um, there is no possibility today um, for the Dimaggi material to get to the lake and to help nourish the point naturally. Um, we can do a little bit of a budget on this. So this uh, 1998 uh, study here that I cited earlier, did actually some, uh, completed the sand budget for the Nemagi River and basically came to the following conclusion. And that conclusion is that the Nemagi River discharges about 6,000 to 7,000 cubic meters per year of sand. That sand is trapped in the harbor. Essentially none of it escapes out the, out the, uh, out the channel. And that material is then dredged. So um, <clears throat> that small amount of sand from the Nemagi River is not going to be sufficient to satisfy any, any needs for long-term beach nourishment on Minnesota Point. All right, moving along, trying to respect people's time here. Excuse me. Uh, last bit of this, the climate change part. Um, ah, sorry. So the question we might ask is how might climate change affect Minnesota Point. And most of the climate models that I've read, the papers about those that I've read, suggest that um, we should expect a warmer and wetter climate moving forward. So there's a couple ways that can affect um, sediment transport and the fate of Park Point. First thing it can do is it can perturb the hydrologic budget. And in doing, that, in doing so, it can increase runoff and at least in principle, increase lake level. And that's no doubt what we are experiencing right now in the last few years. So in the long term though, the issue, the question one might ask is how sensitive is Lake Superior to changes in its hydrologic budget? And from a runoff perspective, um, I think I might argue that it is at least somewhat buffered because it has a relatively small catchment compared to its surface area. So 
Lake Superior in contrast to typical lakes where the catchments are much larger than the lake area. Lake Superior is perhaps slightly less sensitive than a typical lake to runoff changes, but still um, potentially sensitive. And again, as I mentioned, I think we are, you know, we're watching this right now unfold in front of our eyes. So this is a complicated and messy slide. I apologize for that. But the point I want to make here is that um, the last 10 years where we've seen uh, lake level uh, recover and rise dramatically to near record levels, that corresponds to a wet phase. Um, and recent NOAA data support that. Uh, basically the last five year period is the wettest on record. Some researchers have studied the presence, they've, they've, they've deconvolved these time series and they have um, teased out a quasi-decadal cyclicity to the hydrologic budget in the upper Midwest. And that uh, cyclicity is driven by changes in atmospheric circulation, so natural climate change. Um, and those give rise to lake level fluctuations of about half a meter or a little more. Okay, and this paper that is, is cited here on this on this slide suggests that that quasi-decadal cyclicity might actually be changing state in the last few decades, and perhaps that is a canary in the coal mine, if you will, of anthropogenic climate change um, manifesting uh, in in the Lake Superior lake level. So we may be moving into a new realm where. Um, the hydrologic budget for the lake is changing again in response to changes in runoff. Um, the obvious effect of that is that if um, we continue to be wet, uh, lake level will continue to rise to a certain extent and that will be um, not good for erosion problems on Park Point and the surrounding coastlines. And this is my point here to plug um, next month's talk. So next month, my colleague, uh, Brandon Crumwhitey, will be giving a talk on Lake Superior water levels and coastal impacts. That'll be April 21st. We'll do the same online format given the brave new world in which we're living. Um, so please attend that. Um, one thing to remember about climate change and perturbations to the hydrologic budget for Lake Superior is that um, much of Lake Superior's behavior, if you will, is dictated by evaporation in the winter. So um, this period is somewhat unique in this sense. It spends all summer warming up and then spends all winter cooling off. And part of that cooling off process is a significant amount of evaporation. And the amount of evaporation we get off the lake is controlled to a large extent by ice cover. So um, that, of course, gives rise to the beautiful phenomena like this. Uh, wonderful lake effect snow imagery. But the question, and I don't have an answer to this, um, one question that might come up is, you know, will a warmer climate, uh, <laughs> that's a typo in there, will a warmer climate reduce ice cover and lead to increased evaporation? Um, I think that's an area of how climate change could affect lake levels that is um, a little less clear in terms of moving, um, how the system will respond. So any changes to the hydrologic cycle that give rise to an increase in lake level are going to exacerbate the, um, the situation in terms of wave attack and erosion on Park Point. <clears throat> there is another way that climate change can affect Park Point. And that is through an increased frequency and or magnitude of the cyclones that move sediment around by longshore transport. So if we increase storminess, if you will, in the Western Arm of the Lake Superior, we are going to increase the efficiency of longshore transport. And as a result of that, coastlines will evolve more rapidly in the future. Um, so what I've done here in the next few slides is that I've done some very preliminary modeling. So I'm a mathematical modeler by, um, I don't know, <laughs> by trade. Um, so I've tried to cook up a very simple morphodynamic model of longshore transport and response of the, um, the barrier island that is Minnesota and Wisconsin Point. I focused my work for this, this talk here right around the Superior Entry because that's somewhat again the canary in the coal mine. And what I did is I basically changed the climate today. 
So I'm going to show you some model results here where essentially we run the system from 1910 up to today with our current climate. And then I artificially introduce a, an abrupt step function in climate where I increase the frequency and magnitude of coastal storms, cyclones, and that allows for more efficient um, longshore transport. So let's take a look at some of those results real quick. Again, these are very, very preliminary, very crude, but I think they are somewhat interesting. So what's shown on this slide right here is just a baseline model where, again, I'm focusing on the superior entry. Um, you're looking at a, a, a Google Earth image and then model results where those are beach profiles. The gray profiles are basically 1910 to modern, which I used to calibrate this model. The red um, profiles are beach, the beach position moving into the future up through about 2120, so another 100 years. Those model results right there were created using just the current baseline climate climate unchanged, okay? And I then took model output and looked at how the thickness, the width, I should say, sorry, of uh, Minnesota Point at its critical location just downstream of the superior entryway, how that changes as a function of time. So that's illustrated in the time series in the upper left of this uh, slide. And what you see is a progressive um, thinning in the width of Park Point. We've dropped about 100 meters over the last 100 years, roughly. And then moving forward in time, uh, this baseline simulation would suggest that within the next century, we stand at a very high risk of breaching Minnesota Point during a large uh, coastal storm. And I might add that the, 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 the um, calibration I used in this model was extremely conservative. So I erred on the side of um, uh, a slower morphodynamic response, if you will. So that's under baseline climate conditions. Um, in this slide, it's the same time series. Again, we're looking at the width of the barrier as a function of time, except that today, 2020, I took the transport efficiency of, of longshore transport and essentially doubled it. And I can do that a variety of ways. Uh, basically, I'm invoking an increase in the frequency and the magnitude of cyclones. Now, that's a large change. And I, I'm certainly not suggesting that that would occur um, uh, at that magnitude. But I think it's illustrative of what we might see. And <clears throat> The take home message from this slide is, is fairly straightforward, and that is that an increase in climate, so an increase in storminess, gives rise to significantly higher rates of sediment transport and therefore significantly uh, faster rates of barrier thinning and ultimately potentially breaching. So, in the second scenario, we've essentially trimmed the time to breaching in half. And I think that's something that um, you know we need to we need to engineer we need to not engineer we need to bring into our calculations of how we might mitigate some of the issues on Park Point. We need to bring in this climate change component and it's a, this in, potential increase in storminess. All right, so final thoughts. I'm two minutes over. Um, sort of wrap things up. For their size, barrier islands and Minnesota Point, whatever you want to call it, Baymouth Bar, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of the day, Minnesota Point is a barrier island. They are some of the most dynamic and most ephemeral landforms on Earth. They come and go overnight, geologically speaking. So what you're looking at here is a Wikipedia image from NASA of the Chandelier Islands. Apologies to any French Canadians or Quebecois on there. I probably butchered that. but. Um, Chandelier Islands are barrier islands off the Mississippi Delta. <clears throat> and what's illustrated here is a before and after scenario. So prior to Hurricane Katrina, the chandeliers were staying alive, but barely. Post Katrina, they reached a tipping point and essentially they uh, were destroyed and they are unlikely to rebuild themselves. So 
there's an analogy to be drawn here between this system as crazy as it seems in the Gulf of Mexico and our system. So the chandeliers are drowned. They are experiencing both sea level rise and subsidence due to sediment compaction. So they're kind of getting a double whammy. But the rate at which that's happening is not terribly different than the rate of lake level rise in the western arm of Lake Superior. They're also starved. All their sand is being trapped behind upstream dams on the Mississippi. And they're battered. They're experiencing an increased frequency and magnitude of tropical cyclones, hurricanes. So the thought I'll leave you with is that there's a very strong analogy between that system and ours. We're drowned. Post-glacial lake level rise is burying us. Drowning us, I should say. We're starved. Essentially, all of our sand supply, primarily from the South Shore, but a bit from the North Shore, is being trapped by ship canals. Okay? And we're battered. The extent to which we're battered is a bit uncertain, but um, many models are pointing again towards an increased frequency and magnitude of mid-latitude cyclones. So that's basically my take-home message. And I think we need to engineer our way, or I'm sorry, we need to um, be aware of these longer term sediment pathways when we try to engineer our way out of some of our erosion problems today. And with that, uh, awkwardly, with no one to look out upon, I thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. There, my contact information is here on this last slide. I'm easy to find, and I certainly would encourage folks to uh, reach out to me if uh, they want to have an offline conversation or anything like that. OK. Thank you so much, uh, John, for that wonderful presentation. So we are taking your questions through that chat box. So if you're in the full screen mode and you seem to have lost it, just move your mouse towards the bottom of your screen and that chat box will uh, be one of the options you can click. So we're going to start with our first question. John, what role does isostatic rebound play in the future of Park, Park Point? And think about would the increased depth of the lake be offset by any sedimentation? Uh, it's a great question. So the question has to do with isostatic rebound and basically the reason why we are experiencing a lake level rise in the Duluth area. Um, <clears throat> the increase in lake level will to some extent be offset by sedimentation in the harbor. Um, I think the effects of it on the lakeward side of the point are are less significant. Um, the main point though to take away is that much like the Chandelier Islands in the Gulf of Mexico, um, if we're not supplying sediment to Park Point, in other words, if we've, if we've shut it down, so to speak, ultimately it's going to drown. Um, you know, the rate at which it will do so is slow on a day-to-day um, standard, but fairly rapid on a geologic um, time scale. So there's, to some extent, uh, and this is a little bit depressing, but are, are short of significant action to mitigate the sediment starvation issue on Park Point, um, the continued isostatic rebound and, and lake level rise will ultimately lead to its drowning. I think that's to some extent unavoidable. Okay, so thinking about that, do you support the idea of beach nourishment on Minnesota Point by the U.S. Army Corps? Ah, gonna pin me down. <laughs> okay. Um, my opinion on that is is mixed. Um, I think it's it, of the of the options on the table, it is the most viable um, because again need to essentially turn on the spigot that we've turned off um, by constructing ship canals. Um, that said, I think, and I tried to highlight this a little bit in my talk, I think uh, the costs associated with that could be tremendous um, and just finding a source of sand. So um, it's going to be difficult. We're not going to be able to close that budget using um, dredgings from the harbor. So we're going to have to seek a different source of sand. It's unlikely that the state of Wisconsin is going to be super excited about uh, Minnesota folks or Corps of Engineers folks essentially uh, 
cannibalizing the sand that's been deposited on the upstream side and transferring it to uh, the Minnesota side. So I think um, that sand nourishment is an option, but I, I, I think it comes with a lot of baggage. And that's, that's my answer. <laughs> so it looked um, in your presentation like the area next to the superior entry was the most vulnerable area for breach. Are there other areas on Park Point that also have a greater risk? Great question. Um, it, correct. I think the area near the superior entry is the um, sort of ground zero for breaching, but there are a few other locations. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good image to show that. Uh, if I'll just pull this one up for a second. Um, if I had been a little more ahead of the game and extended this imagery a bit down to the right, there is a point uh, or a location, I should say, on Wisconsin Point where the, the, the barrier's width is very narrow. Um, it's actually essentially an, an area that's not really um, just a little bit out of the, see if I can come up with a coherent sentence here. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit out of this picture. It is subject to relatively little deposition over the last hundred years because it's sort of at the edge of the depositing sand wedge. And then to complicate matters, this is the point I want to make, it's being cannibalized from the bay, the harbor side, by continued lake level rise. So I didn't discuss this in, in this talk for time purposes, but the point itself, uh, we focused on the lakeward side. On the land side, on the bay side, it's also being cannibalized much more slowly, but cannibalized nonetheless by lake level rise and some wave erosion. Um, the other, just to finish that answer to that question, uh, you, you, clearly we have a similar situation to the south of the Duluth entry, where we are sort of have a locus for erosion. Um, I think the rates associated with erosion there are going to be, or have been, and will continue to be significantly less than near the Superior entry. So I think the the thought of a breach occurring there is. Um, less likely than a breach occurring on the uh, superior entry. Have you considered dr drilling and using OSL dating to constrain the age of Park Point or the strand, the drowned strand plans? Well, yes, I have. Um, uh, some colleagues and I are in the in the midst, the throes, if you will, of putting together a proposal to do exactly that. So um, we would like to obtain some funding to uh, drill a series of, of of holes, of cores, if you will, along the length of Park Point, Minnesota Point, and extract some core uh, cores with uh, organic matter and quartz grains, and essentially use some techniques that geologists have in their back pocket to date those sediments and therefore come up with a, a constraint on the age of Park Point, which I think would be useful to understanding basically what happened about 1200 years ago in this transition from uh, lake level fall to lake level rise. And that tells us in, so you might ask, the one might, that begs the question, what does a 1200 year ago response have to do with modern behavior? And the answer is it tells us how the system came to be, how it was born, and therefore it gives us a better understanding of its fate. Okay, we're getting close to the one o'clock hour. So I wanted to point out on your chat that Madison put up a link so you can sign up to receive more information on future climate conversations. Um, that is through the glove delivery system. And that will also be how we will distribute um, information about how this recording is being released. So just to be mindful of your time, but we'll continue to take some more questions. Um, John, what would happen to Park Point if the superior entry brick walls were removed? Great question. So in a, in a world where that was an option, um, if the superior entry brick walls were removed, the system would respond quite quickly. And um, we would see essentially the slide that's on the screen right now, the wedge of sediment that was deposited in the last hundred odd years, 
uh, would very quickly be redistributed, smeared out, if you will, um, to the Northwest. And it would begin to mitigate um, the starvation issue. If we waited long enough, and long might mean another 100 years or more, um, in principle, we could restore some of the width to uh, Minnesota Point downstream of the Superior Entry. Um, and that, that signal would continue to propagate towards Duluth um, through time. So, uh, you know, in essence, if you take away the perturbation that's messing things up, the system will respond and uh, in a favorable manner. Okay, John, I'm not sure if um, you feel comfortable answering this question, but what engineering solutions have been proposed to protect the homes and businesses on Park Point, and what are their chances of success for the long term? So the issue of long term has different meanings. Um, let's stay with a sort of decadal scale long term. I think uh, one solution is some temporary, maybe not temporary is the right term, but semi-permanent um, offshore features that are often called uh, gabions, which, and they go by different names as well, but basically they are structures um, that are designed to sit at or slightly below fair weather wave base and essentially dissipate wave energy during large storms and therefore protect the beach from uh, further cannibalization during this time period of high lake levels. That model um, works in the, in the sort of, again, decadal to multi-decadal time scale. It will not resolve the fundamental overarching issue, which is one of sediment starvation. Um, that approach is costly. Um, basically any approach is costly. I would say of the approaches it is probably um, the least expensive but its its lifespan and its effects are uh, you know again kind of multi-decadal time scales. So building on the idea of solutions, could a potential solution be to re-nourish Minnesota Point by pumping it with sand from the Wisconsin Point across the Superior Entry? Um, I, yes, in principle. Um, I think certainly uh, there would be ways to engineer that. Um, I think there could be some serious uh, political concerns that spawn from that approach. What type of wave attenuation out into the lake near the Superior Entry would possibly reduce sand movement away from the entry? Good question. So um, again, the idea of essentially installing not breakwaters, but um, sub uh, aqueous features that act to dissipate wave energy or to attenuate wave energy um, could be quite effective, um, costly, but quite effective if located near the sort of, you know, the, the, the danger zone, if you will, um, just downstream of the superior entry. Um, again, that won't erase the problem completely, but it will help to mitigate the rates. Are you aware of any way we could modify the superior entry so that it would still be a viable entry for navigation purposes, but allow for sediment transport to Minnesota's point? Again, another great question. I've I've mulled that over a little bit, and I've you know come up with my Rube Goldberg kind of buried pipes that transport sediment slurry from the Wisconsin side to the Minnesota side. I think there are ways to get around some of these issues. I just I you know I, I first of all I'm not a coastal engineer, um, and I suspect that any strategy that involves essentially cannibalizing what Wisconsin residents might somewhat rightfully think of their of their as their own to nourish the Minnesota side of things uh, just could be quite problematic politically. Are the nearby glacial outwash deposits in Minnesota viable for mining for beach nourishment? Hmm. 
Good question. I think the short answer is probably not. And um, the issue there being that it's it's if 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 one if we could find, uh, I'm sorry, Melanie, was that did they mention outwash in there or did they? The glacial outwash deposits. Okay. All right. So outwash deposits, yes. Um, so the idea here is that outwash deposits have um, been sorted by fluid water, and therefore the fines component has been separated from the sand. Uh, so essentially we have a sand pit that could be mined. Um, certainly those that would serve as potentially a source of sand if the grain size distribution were okay, and presumably it wouldn't be too far off. Um, I think the major limitation there is going to be transport costs, plain and simple. Okay. Do we need two entries for commercial purposes? I'm not sure. I. I am not qualified to answer that question in any way, shape, or form. Um, I suspect, I'll just speculate a little bit here, that uh, without, you know, there's a certain level of redundancy provided by having two entries and the, uh, the prospect of losing that redundancy could probably cause um, the shipping industry some gas pains. Okay, do you know if wave attenuation features could work on the North Shore to reduce the bluff erosion? I do believe they would. I, I actually, whoever submitted that question should contact me offline. Um, I can provide some actual evidence of the feasibility of that working um, in my own neighborhood. So uh, just without going into a lot of detail, there are some features that were constructed uh, on the beach in front of my house or in my neighborhood, I should say. and it's very clear to see over the last 50 or 60 years how they have, those features have essentially protected the bedrock bluff from erosion. It's actually kind of fascinating. And I have some great pictures that I would be happy to share with um, the individual that asked that question. Unfortunately, I don't have any slides to show that. So the short answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Okay, well, we've went through all of the questions. Thank you so much for going over. Um, again, I wanna remind everyone that we have the monthly climate conversations, next one being April 21st, and that's Brandon Crumwitty. Um, I'm going to resend that link so you can sign up to get our email delivery, and this presentation is being recorded, and we'll make that available to you. Uh, again, thank you so much, John. All right, thanks everyone.